Okay, so uh, we concluded last night, last time, and um, I want to. We found that the coefficients are the same whether we include uh, both predictors or um, use only one. Okay, so I was having some trouble with the camera here. So, um, right. So now let's suppose. Um, what else is true? So the other effect is that um, the extra sum of squares is equal to the sum of squares in SLR as well. So also is true. So the second result, which I won't prove, but we'll show it. Um, when predictors uncorrelated, then the extra sum of squares uh, equals the SSR in the SLR models. Let's uh, let's see what this. So in in so for example, SSR x1, if I just have x1, this will be equal to SSR x1 given x2. And SSR x2 will be equal to SSR x2 given x1. So the fact that x1 is in the model already does not um, diminish or increase um, the um, explanatory power of x2. Um, let's do a little numeric example. I'm not going to put the data down, but just suppose we have x sample. Made, this is made up. Suppose we have um, y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1. And suppose this is the, for the same data, so the model, so say y is fixed, so we have SSTO is equal to say 100 just based on y and say SSR we find here SSR x1 to be after we estimate it with with data and everything to be 30. Um, so this is a for b suppose we take um, now we want to take a different predictor okay and we have the same SSTO so same y. Okay, uh, then see if I model uh, with both. So if I have then we have SSR x1 x2. Um, what do you think? Well, this is equal to, I could do it either way. I could say this is SSR X1 plus SSR X2 given X1. That's always true by definition of what these are from earlier chapter. And um, if uncorrelated, if correlation X1, X2 equals zero, then this is equal to is equal to SSR X1 plus this becomes SSR X2. So it should just equal 80. They will just be additive like this. Okay. Um, so since we're here as a practice for you, if N equals 12, uh, in this case, in this example, what's the p-value for test okay 
Um, now, not a lot to say about when they're perfectly correlated. Um, for one thing, if R12 is 1, uh, if R12 is 1, this has to, the only way this is possible is if, um, the only way this is possible in, um, in, in the two predictor case would be if, um, would be if, uh, yeah, if, um, I, I, I'm just, um, trying to think of the best way to say it, is if, um, yeah, is if, if, um, one of the predictors is equal to, um, you know, um, a linear combination of the other predictor and the vector of ones. So um, this this implies the columns of the matrix X are not independent, all right? So if this is true, actually um, the whole model can be reduced by one predictor. You can combine the two vector, the two predictor vectors into a single predictor vector without losing any information. And you should do that and reduce the model. So it's not an issue. Um, but it's also very rare. So this is basically not a case to uh, get overly concerned about. Um, it's more to uh, think about it when we're trying to think what happens when the two predictors are significantly correlated because this is sort of the limiting case of that. So maybe I should write some words down about that. So if, so let's just write this down. If um, x1 x2 are perfectly correlated so say r12 equals 1 um, well then this implies xtx X inverse doesn't exist and you're done So only comments, we'll just write some comments about this, but first of all, one, this is rare. Two, if this happens, it's almost, it's a good thing really. A model can be by combining, by adding, say, by combining predictors, uh, by adding them, for example, making a new one, um, or, or some other linear combination of them to make create a new predictor. That involves both those things. Uh, the units might change, but still all the same information is there. So this is a good thing. Okay, but, okay, so last case. Suppose, however, that um, R12 is high. Okay, so they're significantly correlated, but not one. which is unrealistic anyway, and not a problem. Okay, let's look at this case. So, so then, what do we have? We have uh, B1 star, let's start with this, equals Ry1 minus R1 to Ry2 over one minus Ry1 squared. And, um, right, and, so if R12 is high, then um, we still have, and still have, so, so this is for this model, Y equals, I'll just write it like this with the lowercase b's, B1 um, star, I can write it in the standard form, B2 star, and we know how to get back to the other one. Um, but, okay. Okay, so this implies that um, B1 star is 
is not equal to just R, Ry1, right? So, so B1 star is not equal to just Ry1. And um, depending on what these are, it can be uh, very different. So, which is in the uncorrelated case. And depending on R12 and also on RY2, um, it can be very different. Well, this should explain if you have a model and you, um, you have an SLR model with X1 and you get some coefficient for it and then you add another variable and that coefficient, now you have two coefficients, so you added X2 and you have B1 and B2. Okay, you get you looking, you're curious, you have B2 and you see um, you have this uh, coefficient you associate with X2. Now your B1 may have changed significantly. It could, we'll show this in a second. It can change sign, it can... Um, it can change magnitude by a lot. So this is because of the correlation between B1 and B2. Okay? Thing is, we like to think of these, I think, when we look at the equation as deterministic equations where the things on the right-hand side, the predictors, independently act as uh, inputs to the response. But in fact, they it is a much more dynamical sit situation than that. And... Um, Every predictor potentially affects every other predictor. You have this much more complicated equation that you're sort of overlaying this uh, very simple uh, model on top of. Okay, let's proceed. Um, okay, so um, can be very different. They can change size. So let's do a little example. So for example, just to see what the numbers do. Oh my God. Already 12 minutes. Um, we'll continue on the other end here. <laughs> 